All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our final webinar of 2023. Um, we're so excited to have you here today. Um, this is a great speaker ahead. Um, before we get started though, just a few housekeeping tips for you. And Allison and I are sharing a computer, so it might take us just a little bit of time here. So here at CSU, we are an equal opportunity and access university. If there's anything that we can do to make your learning experience easier and better, please let us know. We are happy to try to do our best to make those accommodations. If you wanna learn more about our principles of community or our land acknowledgement statement, you can visit uh, colostate.edu to find that information. When you're done today with this webinar and you wanna learn more, you can go to our cohorts blog, that's csuhort.blogspot.com. That's where we're gonna house all of our upcoming webinars and those links for you to register, but also we'll have those recorded webinars for you to go back and watch some of the subjects that maybe you missed earlier in the year. And then finally, um, before we get started, um, go ahead and join us next month on January 10th at noon. We're going to have Dr. Chad Miller with us doing best of CSU annuals and perennials. So if you have your phone handy, you can scan that QR code, or you can again visit us at csuhort.blogspot.com, and that'll take you to the registration link. All right, without further ado, I want to introduce my favorite colleague, Allison O'Connor. Allison is with Larimer County Extension. She's been with Extension for quite a while, um, and she's going to talk to us today about fresh new myths. And so just a little bit about Allison, um, her favorite holiday cookie is ginger molasses. She loves amaryllis and Christmas cactus this time of year, and not so much on the poinsettia, but that's okay. Um, but she's gonna treat us with some fresh new myths, things you've never heard before from Allison O'Connor. So I'm gonna turn it over to Allison and we'll get started. Thank you, Amy. She's gonna scoot around to the other side of the table. Welcome everybody. We're so glad that you are here. Thanks for joining us. And we will put that registration for January 10th into the chat so you can check that out. It is on the cohorts blog and I will have it at the end of the presentation as well. So you can be sure to register for fresh gardening information in the new year. So let's go ahead and get started with our myths. What is a myth? I wish unicorns were real, but they are not, much to the dismay of my two nieces. Essentially a myth is a widely held but generally false belief or idea. Now, myths are not necessarily bad. They're not harmful. They're fun to believe in, like the world of Harry Potter. How great would it be if we actually had that world exist? But for the most part, these myths are untrue. And so we have them a lot in society and in gardening in particular, we run into a lot of myths um, of how we do gardening, how we um, approach gardening, maybe things that we were told when we started gardening, um, and we'll debunk actually five of those today. So myths are prevalent in society, and you've probably heard a few of these things. I just googled really quickly like myths that you heard as a kid, and there were so many, and I started laughing because as a kid I believed all of these things. So the first is, of course, if you swallow your chewing gum, it will stay in your stomach digestive tract for seven years. This isn't true. Obviously, we get rid of our, our stuff. But what is interesting about chewing gum is that it actually is expelled whole. So it doesn't break down. Um, so there's a fun fact for you today. Um, another one is drinking coffee stunts your growth. So when you were little and you were like 10, 11, 12, and mom and dad were drinking coffee, and you're like, hey, can I have a cup? And they're like, no, it will stunt your growth. You won't be five, seven. You'll only be five, six and a half. Um, that is a myth, and it, it is not true today, although having kids drink coffee is probably not necessarily the best approach. Uh, one that has sprouted on my own head is gray hairs. So if you remove a hair, a gray hair, you will get two in its place. This is a myth because each hair has one individual follicle. So that hair is only going to sprout one at a time. That follicle will only produce one hair. So you can I guess, pluck to your heart's content, although the person who cuts your hair may not agree with that as much. So just leave them and embrace the grayness. Um, and then eating carrots will improve your eyesight. Well, that's not true. I ate a ton of carrots and I was diagnosed as legally blind when I was in fourth grade and have had corrective lenses and such for um, 
numerous years. So anyway, those are myths that you've probably heard of and they're everywhere. Some are harmless fun. So we can believe in Sasquatch. We can believe in Nellie the Nut Loch Ness Monster. Those are absolutely things that we can believe in. Um, but other times myths can be really kind of dangerous. Um, so, you know, one thing is if a little of something works, you should then use a lot. Uh, this could be equivalent to the use of pesticides. So if you use a little bit of insecticide to kill XYZ insect, you should use a lot more because it will take care of the problem more quickly. Um, so just be very cautious when you hear myths. And this is why these talks are really fun because uh, we get to hear more about the science behind some of these things. So it is hard to kind of dispel what we have in our society. So, you know, we don't necessarily believe everything we read or everything we hear, but we do tend to take a lot of things at face value. So there's an amazing website called Spurious Correlations, and it's essentially graphing things that are completely opposite of each other, and that would never actually happen. But putting them on the same graph and you look at this graphic and you're not necessarily looking at the data or what's being represented, you're like, wow, yeah, that's, that's a pretty close graphing angle that we can see. So in this case, we are looking at the letters and winning words of the script National Selling Bee, Spelling Bee and then the number of people that are killed every year by venomous spiders. So we have a correlation. We have the exact same graph for both of these things, but of course, one has nothing to do with the other. Um, and so this is where spurious correlations come into play, where we can actually manipulate some of that data to make it work for the point that we're trying to make. And headlines, graphs, you know, sometimes they're to get a laugh. So these are all from The Onion, which if you're not familiar with, is basically like a satirical newspaper, and they come up with just the most absurd headlines and articles and things like that. These are purely for laughing purposes. Um, and I was trying to find some of the ones that actually made me laugh out loud. Um, the one I particularly enjoyed is the world death rate is holding steady at 100%. <laughs> um, you know, no one gets out of this life alive, unfortunately. Um, I also enjoyed the CIA has been using black highlighters all of those years. So all those confidential documents that have the black lines through them, it was due to black highlighters. So some things are obviously to get a laugh. Um, we are a society that needs to laugh and share things. And, you know, it's great to share those um, with your friends and family and things like that. But then there are other headlines that might give you pause, or you see something in your newsfeed, or you hear a story on the radio or the news. Um, and it, it might get you thinking about things. And hopefully then you take that and you go a step further. And again, not necessarily take it at face value. So there are things in our society that are very prevalent throughout gardening, throughout horticulture, um, throughout our crop systems and things like that, that do need to be considered. Uh, but let's go into debunking some of those myths. So again, think twice maybe before you post anything unless you're doing it just for a laugh um, because a lot of times we post things that agree with what we think and what we believe and it may not be the truth, um, but it fits with our perception of what that can be. So again, think twice about some of those myths and think hard if it is factual or not. Here in Colorado, gardening can be really difficult. If you've moved to Colorado for from a different state, a different place, a different place in the world, you know that you're facing some unique challenges in a semi-arid environment. We have wild temperature swings, we have a ton of precipitation. And so some of that information that you might obtain from other parts of the country or the world may not be wrong. It may not be bad information, but it might not be relevant to the situation that you're dealing with specifically in your Colorado gardening or your garden in the West. So just remember, we have those unique challenges in climate. We have a lot of microclimates that we deal with. We have these roller coaster temperatures. We have short-ish growing seasons. All of those things come into play. Um, so again, if you are referencing information from perhaps you moved here from Texas and you're still going to Texas A&M for your information or um, another resource, just know that that information may not translate as well as you think to your Colorado garden, but some of it might. And so it's really hard to kind of wade through all of that. So use valid resources, help separate that fact from fiction as you do your research to try to decide how to make decisions that are best for you. 
Um, Amy or Tony in the chat can type in my favorite search term, which is any term you use, and I use Google as my primary search browser, but you can type in site colon edu, and what that does is it limits just educationally based websites into your search term. So it throws out the dot coms, it throws out some of the commentary, the reddits and things like that, and it just gives you hopefully research based information. So just be aware of that when you're doing any sort of research. So let's jump into our myths. We're going to cover five things, and these are what we will discuss. So houseplants, trees, pine needles, lawns, and then poinsettias, which of course are all the rage right now during this time of the year. The first myth I want to talk about is houseplants clean the air. So I am sure you have heard this, right? Put a few houseplants in your house or your office. It's going to scrub pollutants from the air. It's going to make you happier, it's going to provide more clean air. Um, and is this actually true? Well, as we know, houseplants are a very trending topic right now. So everybody got into gardening uh, during COVID, during 2020, 2021 and beyond. And houseplants in particular really ticked upwards because of a lot of the millennials who decided to become plant parents. I know I have adopted several houseplants in the last few years and I'm very proud to say they're still living because I'm I don't have the best track record, uh, but houseplant sales in the United States is almost $2 billion. This is just houseplants, your pothos and your snake plants, almost $2 billion. Um, also, almost 38 million homes have participated in indoor gardening in some way, shape or form. And about two thirds of us own at least one houseplant. So that's pretty fun too. Um, I don't have nearly as many as this, but there are people out there who are far more experienced and far more obsessed with houseplants than I am. And so what's so great about them? Well, there's this thing called biophilia, and it's basically a human connection to nature or green plants. So we have this attraction to green plants, and it doesn't necessarily have to be houseplants, but the reason we grow houseplants is because we want to bring nature inside into our homes. So we, as humans, have been cultivating plants and growing them for thousands of years and have actually also brought them into our own living spaces. Bringing houseplants into the office became really popular post-World War II because people started working more. We weren't at home as much, and so we wanted to replicate that homey feel in our offices that we had um, in the places where we live. Um, so we've had this centuries-old partnership with love for plants, we experience biophilia, and everyone knows who gardens are just, you know, if you go into a greenhouse or you buy something, um, cut flowers even from the grocery store, you know that it kind of changes things in you. It might bring you a sense of relaxation, it might decrease your anxiety, um, and so houseplants do that as well. So do houseplants clean the air? This was first launched by NASA back in 1989, and we love NASA. They've done a ton of great things, and of course, they've sent plants into space, and they've grown things, and they grew tomatoes, and maybe this week you heard about the story of the tomato that was lost on the space shuttle. That was actually really funny. I suggest you uh, Google that because the tomato was found, uh, but it was lost for a significant amount of time, so who knows what happens to tomatoes once they're floating around the space shuttle, but back in 1989, NASA sent some plants up to, um, up to space and they were doing some studies. So they were tracking, you know, what the plants were doing, how much oxygen they were putting off. Did it improve the moods of the astronauts? Did it help clean the air? And one of their conclusions was that these plants actually removed these VOCs, these volatile organic components or um, chemicals, these VOCs from the air. Unfortunately, this was done in a sterile lab setting and it didn't really translate into the new world. So what they found wasn't untrue. Um, it just didn't translate to us in our homes and our businesses. So then in, in 2020, uh, Drexel University researchers published this in Nature. Uh, if you know anything about publication, Nature is a pretty big deal. Um, and what these researchers did is they reviewed over a dozen studies over this 30 year period. So houseplants have been studied 
uh, scientifically for decades. And so they did a huge lit review to see what they could find. Um, and what they found is that any building's ventilation, any home's ventilation, even cracking a window does a better job at removing those VOCs than house plants. Then they took it a step further and they extrapolated the data to find out how many plants you would need in order to actually keep in line with the windows or a building's ventilation. And you would need to have 100 to 1,000 plants per square meter in order to simulate the same effect that an open window has. This is obviously not possible. You can't grow 100 plants per square meter. It'd be virtually impossible. So lesson learned here is that while plants do remove VOCs, having a good ventilation system, opening a window, that kind of thing um, is going to be better. But don't let this deter you from growing houseplants because they are great. We love houseplants. So things that houseplants do do is that they can help improve concentration and memory. So if you need something at the office to help you focus because you have all these tasks, bringing in some green plants can do that. They can also make you more efficient by 15%. And I think that's great because when we all like to be more efficient and not dwaddle and you know, kind of delay things that we need to get done. Um, they've also led to reduce anxiety, reduce stress levels. Um, people who have green plants in their office tend to call in sick less. So, um, that could be a great thing. And then in a classroom setting, it also helps improve concentration. So this is a study that we're going to look at at CSU is putting some green plants in classrooms on campus and then, you know, assessing the students. How did they do on their exams in a room that had plants versus didn't have plants? A lot of the research in this area has been done more on elementary age children and then not as much on higher ed kids. So, um, Stay tuned for that. Hopefully we'll know more in a couple of years, but houseplants are great. So absolutely keep them as part of your planting. Um, I'm gonna do a bonus myth with houseplants and this is the myth of misting. So maybe you've heard that, you know, we're a dry climate, Colorado, we have to use chapstick more. We don't have a lot of relative humidity. And so you should mist your houseplants to increase the relative humidity and help keep them happier. This is also not true, unfortunately, because any misting is basically gone within a few minutes. And so if you wanted to do any benefit for your plants, you would need to mist and mist and mist all day long. And that would be one thing. The other thing you need to think about is liquid water. So the droplets in the mist are not the same as water vapor, which is generally what the plant uses in order to conduct their, um, their physiology and plant functions. Uh, so misting doesn't actually really help your plants. Um, you know, keeping plants in a shower might get you a little bit more of leeway, especially if you're growing a lot of those tropicals that really like those misty conditions. Uh, but for the most part, purposely misting plants like the Schefflera is not going to be beneficial. Um, I should note that are, there are a couple plants, so air plants, orchids, they do absorb water through um, their leaves in the case of air plants and through their roots. So they take that, um, that humidity, that water vapor in the air, and they actually use that to their benefit. But for the most part, other plants do not. Myth one done. So our second one is you should plant big trees because it's worth the added cost because you get more bang for your buck. So let's look into this. So we're a society of instant, and I grew up eating cream of wheat as a kid. My dad actually worked at the cream of wheat plant in Minnesota, and so this was a staple in our household. And I just laughed because, you know, the two and a half minute cook time for cream of wheat doesn't seem like that big of a commitment, but apparently it was, and we needed to shave off 90 seconds in order to have the one minute cream of wheat. So we want things fast and we want to eat our cream of wheat within a minute, not two and a half. So we're a society of instant and the same goes for our landscapes. The pros of planting larger trees is that you get this instant landscape. You have an immediate effect. Um, it might increase or it might increase your property values immediately because again, mature landscaping can add somewhere around 15 to 20 percent of your home's value. Um, you may have more rapid development of shade, and then big stuff tends to be less damaged by people and animals. 
Now, the cons of planting larger plant material, and in this case trees, is that it's obviously a lot more expensive. If you've been in the market for trees lately, you know that trees are an investment, um, but smaller plant material is going to be less expensive and also kinder to your checkbook um, versus big stuff. Um, for the nursery, the bigger they are, the more space they take up. So it's going to require more resources from the nursery itself to care for these plants long-term. Um, they're really heavy. The larger the plant, I mean, if you're talking about a bald and burlap tree that's maybe a four inch caliper, you're talking about hundreds of pounds, something that you would need either a forklift to help you with or several very beefy people um, who are strong that can help you do that. Um, you have to dig a bigger hole. So we talked about tree planting. Nobody wants to dig a bigger hole and they don't establish as well. So what was interesting with this is that this was research done because this has been a debate um, in horticulture for a long time. Should you plant small trees or should you plant big trees? So the researchers at Texas A&M back in 2016, um, what they did was a pretty novel study and I really liked every aspect of it. I have to say I geeked out a little bit when I read this one. So what they did is they grew identical clones. So to eliminate the complaint that the trees were not the same to begin with at the very start of the study, they took cuttings and they grew identical clones of three different tree species. So there is the chaste tree, which is not a species we can grow in Colorado, chaste tree, I don't know how you say it, um, but it's like a smaller ornamental, has really cute flowers. Um, then red maple and bald cypress, both of which should be familiar to you. So they grew these three tree types and then they planted them in five different container sizes and you can see them here. So as small as a one gallon, just a little itty bitty guy, all the way up to like a 45, which is going to be probably two feet in diameter um, across the, the root ball. They grew those out and then they planted them into two different landscapes. So the Aggies down in Texas found that after one growing season, and granted, we will, we will say that Texas does have a different growing environment. One of their sites was at College Station, which is very hot and very dry in the summer. So a different zone, but not as much precipitation as, we would, as they would get in other parts of Texas. So we can kind of translate that to Colorado. But after one growing season, the red maple and the bald cypress from the number threes, so not a very big container. I mean, we're maybe eight inches across the top. They exhibited the best growth. So they were planted and they actually grew that first season, which is kind of unheard of for trees. A lot of times we put trees into the ground and they kind of pout. They don't do a lot. They're in transplant shock. They're not sure what to do. They put effort into root growth as opposed to the top of the tree. So that was really interesting. Um, the two largest container sizes, the number 25s and the 45s, all grew poorly. Did not matter on the species, did not matter on the location. The bigger the tree, the more poorly they did following transplanting. They even lost some of those trees as well. So some of them did die. Um, what they found with the chast tree is that the trees from chast trees, from a number one, the littlest container, compared to a number 45, the biggest one, in just three years was larger. Three years, a little tiny number one outgrew, became larger, was taller in every way, shape and form than the number 45s. So hopefully this has you thinking, maybe I'll plant smaller trees. So really what this proved is that planting smaller trees, if you can, and if you have the ability, in just a few years, you'll get a lot more bang for your buck and maximum economic gain. I can't tell you if it's worth it. You only can decide that. So if you want that instant landscape, you might invest in larger trees. But if you're patient and can wait three to five years, a lot of times those trees are going to be much larger than the ones that were larger to begin with. So again, less investment from you up front. Um, they're going to cost less, smaller planting hole, easier to move, less to maintain at the beginning, all of those are pros and then you have a larger tree at the end of a period of time. So again, I think smaller trees are possible. Again, you have to work with what your regulations are because there are a lot of HOAs and other places that might have a minimum caliper that is required for your location. Right, moving on to myth number three. 
pine needles will acidify the soil. This is not a new myth, um, and it is probably one that you may have heard before. Uh, so this is Augusta National. This is down in Georgia. They are famous for having their pine needle rough, um, beautiful to hit off as a golfer, I will say. The pine needles are spectacular. Um, but if you miss a fairway at Augusta, you've missed pretty bad because their fairways are huge. Here in Colorado, we have soils that are higher in pH. So we have the pH scale in the middle is seven, that's neutral. Um, and if you move from another part of the country, particularly the East Coast, maybe even the Midwest, your soils tend to be lower than seven. So you're more um, acidic. So anything under seven is considered to be acidic. Anything above seven is considered to be alkaline. Here in Colorado, our average pH is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 7.5 to 8.5. People move to Colorado and they are desperate to change their soil pH. They want the blueberries. They want the azaleas and rhododendrons and they will really do anything to get those plants. My theory is, is if you move to Colorado, work with what you have. You know, we have a lot of great plants that can substitute for blueberries like serviceberry. We have a lot of great plants that could be a substitute for azaleas and rhododendrons. And azaleas and rhododendrons aren't without their problems. I feel like it's the holy grail. We want everything and we're willing to do whatever we can. But really with some of these acid loving plants, I would say forget it and move on to something that you actually can plant. So there is a thought that pine needles will help acidify our soils. Do they? No, they don't. Um, when they're on the tree or when they drop, when they're freshly dropped on the ground, and this would be pine, spruce, and other evergreens, their needle pH is actually very low. It's, it's like three, three and a half um, on the pH scale. So yes, the needles themselves are acidic, but as soon as they drop, they are starting to decompose. They are starting to get microbes coming in from the soils. And, you know, for a lot of it, that, that acidity isn't going to stay long. The other thing is in Colorado, most of our soils have a lot of free lime. What this means is that anytime an acid like pine needles or vinegar, anything like that is added, it's immediately neutralized by all of that free lime in our soils. So you can try as hard as you want to modify your soil pH, and maybe you could get it to drop, you know, 0.2 units over decades. You can go from like 7.6 to 7.4, but you could never, if you have free lime, go from seven and a half down to six and a half to grow blueberries. It's just really not feasible because of that free lime and the immediate neutralization that occurs. Now, Pine needles are a great mulch, and I will say that if you have access to them or if you live in an area where you have um, pine trees, spruce trees, let the needles drop and let it go as an organic mulch. This is not a wise decision if you live in a fire prone area, um, but they do make an excellent mulch. The needles tend to knit together. Um, they don't blow around. They're really good about keeping weeds out. And so pine needles really do have a lot of benefit, but not the acidifying aspect that you might think of. You can use them for other things. Now, a lot of people tend to get upset because underneath their pine trees, underneath their spruce, they're having trouble getting things to grow, whether that's grass, whether it's ground covers, any sort of green plant under the shade of pine and spruce, it tends to struggle. So a couple things as we go a little bit further into this myth. A couple things about that is whatever was established first in your landscape and is more mature is going to have an advantage. So if you have a large mature tree in your backyard, a big honey locust, let's say, or a large Austrian pine, and you come in and you decide that you want to plant some grass or a ground cover underneath that, it's going to struggle, okay? The reverse is true. If you put a newly planted tree in the middle of your 30-year-old lawn, the lawn has been there for 30 years. Your newly planted tree has, you know, just barely the roots to support itself, and so the lawn can outcompete it. So whatever was established first is going to have an advantage. And when it comes to trees, they are going to have a significant advantage because they are taller. 
So if you're having trouble growing grass or ground covers or anything under trees, it's because the tree is taking all of the good light. Trees reduce the amount of light available, so they'll reduce the number of hours of light that an area gets. They reduce the duration and they reduce the quality. We're not going to go into wavelengths and things like that, uh, but just know that the tree for the most part is taking all the good light, which plants do need, they need some good light, and then whatever filters down to the ground, and depending on the canopy of the tree, it may not be a lot, uh, that's what below gets. So just know that there's a lot of things. The light quality is essentially the wavelength. So going back to your days in biology, um, Again, I just said this, the light quality at the top of the tree is better than what the turf receives. So if you do have a honey locust that provides more dappled shade, the dappled shade that gets through does provide some light for those plants to grow, but it's not in the wavelengths that the plant actually needs or will benefit the plants. Another thing is for grass or ground covers, having morning light, which tends to be better quality, um, is the key to having good grass growth. So if you get filtered light, not only is it reduced, you're not getting as much as intense sunlight, um, you're also not getting the quality that the plants need in order to function properly. So you get kind of stringy looking turf or stretch turf, or you get you know, kind of pathetic ground cover growth. And so again, we, we struggle with growing things under plants because of light quality, but also we struggle because it's dry and it is just too shady. So trees, this is a pine tree, this is on campus, on the CSU campus. Um, trees are going to outcompete a lot of those plants. They are bigger, they have the advantage. So not only do they have a bigger canopy, they also have a more extensive root system in the soil. And so they have the advantage to take all of the water nutrients and things like that. Um, so underneath a pine tree or a spruce, if you just have a plethora of needles, I would encourage you to leave them, um, but you're not going to get much to grow because it's just too shady and too dry to provide a good habitat for other plants, whether that be grass or your ground covers. The other thing is, is growing stuff by the trunks of trees means you have to maintain that. If it's grass and having grass grow to the base of trees, you have to somehow maintain that grass with mowing or string trimming. And we all know that sometimes those things can cause damage to those plants. So having no turf, having no plants is easier maintenance for you. Um, you may not love the look of it, but then you also have to look to nature. So if you're up in the forest and you're walking around, you'll have a beautiful duff layer below your feet, right? Of all these needles, all of these things that have been shed and very few other plants, very few other understory plants. You'll just have a lot of expanse of needle drop and things like that. So instead of removing those needles, I would leave them in place, unless again, you're in a fire prone area. Um, and don't try to grow a lot because it's going to be a really, it's gonna be an uphill battle. This also goes when you have a maturing landscape. And as our landscapes mature, as trees get bigger, as we have more shade, we're going to have to adjust our maintenance practices as well. So what was maybe once turf might need to be converted to a new landscape bed with some shade tolerant perennials or shrubs. Um, and that's just adjusting as things go on. So remember your landscape is ever changing and then you need to adjust with it as well. That is the myth of uh, pine needles. They are acidic, they do not acidify our soil. Two different facts there. All right, so myth number four is lawns are bad. Oh, lawns. So we have had a lot of press about lawns in Colorado. Um, a lot of chatter, a lot of new legislation happening um, and lawns have been kind of targeted um, as being bad. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So Colorado is obviously a semi-arid state. We are in a location where we might get eight to 15 inches of precipitation a year. Uh, based on this last year, we had a ton of rain in the spring and then things have kind of dried out since then. Um, but we're on the higher end of what we tend to get and where you live will determine how many inches you get. Um, I'm in Windsor. People in Loveland, people in Fort Collins tend to get more rain and snow than we do in Windsor. There is something about I-25 that sucks all the moisture out of the air and it 
skips over, usually goes to Greeley and then on to Logan, Morgan counties. Um, but it's very weird, the phenomenons of weather patterns in Colorado. Um, but obviously the word is out that Colorado is great. It's wonderful to live here. We have a lot of amazing things about this state and then people are moving in. So we have increasing populations. They're starting to put more demand on our water supply. And really at the end of the day, we want to make sure that people can flush their toilets and shower. Um, and so we need to make sure that we have enough water for our resources and for the population here in Colorado. So in gardening, xeriscaping or doing water-wise gardening practices, it can reduce outdoor water use by up to 60%. And that's significant. So that can mean um, reducing inputs on turf. It could mean planting more natives. It could be swapping out your irrigation heads. There's a lot that you can do to help reduce your outdoor water bill. Um, because we've all seen those, for those of us who pay the water bill, we've seen those creeps and those increases that have happened over the last few years and are likely to continue. But what I want you to know is that our green places and our green spaces, just like I mentioned that connection we have with plants, that biophilia, it is important to remember and to know that landscaping as a whole in Colorado is using only 3% of the total water in the state. So when we have the water come in from snowpack generally, 60% of that leaves Colorado. So it goes elsewhere, California, uh, Arizona, other places. So we only get to keep 40% of what originates in Colorado. And then of that 40%, most of it is used for agriculture. So um, croplands, cattle, pigs, you know, all of those things that are producing a healthy economy um, and giving us crops and things like that, a lot of it is still going to agriculture. Then of that 40%, just 3%, 3% is used for landscaping. And that 3% includes golf courses, parks, your home lawns, your home landscapes, your HOA green belts, all of that is included in the 3%. So it's a pretty good bang for your buck, right? We're not talking about a huge portion of the water um, that we're using, but regardless, we still need to be conservative in how we use that and to make sure that we're making wise decisions. Um, in the last 10 years, you should be really proud if you lived in the state for 10 years, you've reduced our per capita water consumption by about 20%. Um, so that's great. That is low flow toilets. That is low flow shower heads. <laughs> Never get the shampoo out. Um, that is swapping out your irrigation heads. That is planting appropriate plants for Colorado and doing proper maintenance as well. So that's huge. And I think that's something that we can continue to do. Um, so we can continue to reduce the amount of water we use, but still maintaining those green spaces that we need for our families, our communities, our kids, our dogs. Um, all of those resources as well. But that's a really interesting point to make. Only 3% of the water um, is used for landscapes. Uh, it is a fact that a lot of your household water budget in the summer is going to gardening um, because you're growing tomatoes, you are growing pumpkins, you want to um, have a place for your kids to play. So you're putting inputs into the lawn, all of those things as well. So again, we can help reduce that because it's a significant amount of money. We've seen the water bill in February and then we get our water bill in July. And it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of money. And so we can make decisions that benefit us and then also help conserve and save some of that water uh, for other uses as well. So proper plant selection and design and maintenance are huge things. Maintenance is such a big thing and a big part of gardening and what we need to do. So back to the myth that lawns are bad. Are they bad? No, they're not bad. There's a lot of benefits to lawns. And I realize that I am not going to convince you if you are on the no lawn bandwagon. And I respect that. I am not here to change your mind. I am not here to try to convert you. I'm just letting you know about lawns as a plant. And lawns as a plant produce oxygen. Remember this, they are producing oxygen. The same could be said for bindweed bindweeds producing oxygen. We don't like that either. Um, but remember, they do a lot of good things. 
they can cool uh, your home's environment. So when they are losing water through evapotranspiration from the leaves and the soil, they are actually putting cooling mechanisms into the atmosphere. So that's good. Um, they're taking, they're a good sink of carbon. So they are a carbon sequesterer. So they are storing carbon um, in the organic matter and the roots um, and that kind of area. So they can actually remove a lot of pollutants that we have um, in our society. Lawns can do this, trees do this, other plants do this, but lawns have been found to be a significant contributor uh, to carbon sequestration. Um, the soil microbe diversity is huge in lawns. Lots of different insects, lots of fun things going on. You know, we have these, we have these studies of how many microbes or how, what is the diversity of living things in a teaspoon of soil and it's in the millions. Um, so there's a lot going on down below our feet. Lawns are also one of the most effective plant cover uh, for preventing soil erosion. So on those really windy days, the soil blows. Sometimes we see that coming off of farmers' fields or exposed uh, areas. Lawns can actually keep that in place, which is a good thing. Um, great for recreation, for soccer games, for playing with the dog, uh, for kids to run around and get all their energy out. Um, they're great for that as well. And for a lot of people, it's an aesthetic thing. Um, they like the look of a lawn. George Washington was one of the first people to have a lawn. He loved the look of a lawn. Um, so for a lot of people, it's almost like a source of pride. But again, that is some people and not everybody. And I respect where you stand on that. Um, and then also mowing the lawn can be really good for exercise. It's a great way to get outside. It's a good way to observe your landscape. Um, and again, it's that connection with nature. Smelling the fresh cut grass can do a lot to improve your mood and your, um, your mental well-being. Here's the thing. Are lawns mismanaged? Absolutely. Yes, they are mismanaged just like other plants are mismanaged. So do we have overwatering of lawns? We sure do. Yeah, we are the ones though. And this is, this is where I really want to make this point is that we shouldn't blame the plant. We shouldn't blame the plant. We are the ones responsible for maintaining them. So if they are being overwatered, if we have water running off on the sidewalk into the street, that comes back to us. It is not the plant. The bluegrass, as much as you'd like to believe, is not getting up out of its place in the lawn and going to turn on your irrigation system. It's kind of cool, uh, but it doesn't do that. So yes, lawns can be mismanaged just like other plants. Bindweed can be mismanaged. Coneflower could be mismanaged, um, other invasive species. So there are things, and we need to, again, refocus on how we're maintaining things and what our tolerance level is. Um, but again, it's not the plant. We can't blame the plant. We need to look further at the maintenance and the design and how they are um, contributing to our landscapes. So to answer the question, is bluegrass appropriate to grow in Colorado? Yes. It has pros and cons, just like every other turf species. Buffalo grass, Bermuda grass, uh, blue grama, brome grass, all of these have pros and cons, and bluegrass is no different. It is the merits of the plant, just like the merits of a catalpa, or an oak tree, or a hackberry. You know, there's a lot of great things about bluegrass. There are some negatives as well. And that can be said for any plant. No plant is perfect. Um, and so we need to obviously put it in the right place, um, just like we do with our other trees and shrubs. Uh, the good thing about bluegrass, it's drought tolerant. And so what that means is in periods of dry weather where it's not getting any precipitation or irrigation, it will go brown. People are bothered by brown. So maybe it's a way we need to refocus our look on lawns and what we expect from them, especially during those really hot July, August, early September months uh, and what it can look like. So we might need to reframe our own expectations, but accept the fact that bluegrass is an okay plant to grow in Colorado. It has its merits, just like Bermuda, just like Buffalo and some of those other plants as well. Um, the big thing is, is if you are going forward in 2024 and converting your turf to something else or reducing maintenance to that piece of turf, that's absolutely fine. I will beg you, please don't forget about your trees and the landscape. 
If they are used to being watered on a regular basis or have been, they can't go cold turkey and just adjust, especially depending on the plant species. So if they are a drought tolerant plant, you can get to that point where they can survive with less water. But if they're a plant that needs more regular water like spruce or some of our, um, maybe some of our maple trees, they need regular water. So don't forget about watering them uh, going forward. So that's my disclaimer about trees. Also, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep ranting. I feel like I'm ranting, but I hope I'm educating you as well. Uh, there is a, a, a phrase out there calling it non-functional turf. Um, and I take offense to that. I don't like non-functional because then we're implying that the plant or the grass isn't doing anything. But even this, and I will call this a stupid turf area, even this little tiny wedge of grass right here is still functioning, right? It's still taking ox, it's still giving us oxygen, it's sequestering carbon, it's preventing runoff as best it can while it's surrounded by concrete. And so I would urge you to instead call it non-essential turf. So it's turf that doesn't necessarily need to be there or it's not necessarily serving a purpose. Um, at CSU, Dr. Koski teaches the Horton or the turf management class, and he calls these stupid turf areas. We can call them stupid turf. Non-essential is kind of a kinder term, um, but non-functional again means that it's serving no purpose. And I think we need to get away from that because these places, regardless if the design of it, um, they do still serve a purpose. And I will say um, this is much easier to maintain, right? It takes two strips with the mower, maybe even one, much easier to maintain less inputs than having that planted into flowers or having it mulched or having something else in that area. So also think about the maintenance required. What you do in your home landscape is very different from what can be done in an HOA or what can be done at a business complex um, because there's only a limited amount of time that people can spend. But Again, let's call it non-essential turf. I'm fine with that. We can call them stupid turf areas, um, but let's steer away from non-functional. And so why is turf used in these areas? <laughs> it's easy because it's cheap. Um, if you think about the square footage of installing grass versus the square footage of installing water-wise plants or natives or anything else, it's much, much, much less. I mean, you can get turf for like you know, a quarter a square foot. It's not very expensive. But if you have the ability and the time and converting that into something else, that is absolutely amazing. Um, I thought I had pictures, but I don't. But you could take this little semicircle that probably isn't doing much and you can convert that into a beautiful perennial garden that attracts pollinators. Um, the one with the spruce tree on there between the two driveways, another great candidate that doesn't necessarily need to be turf. So work with your uh, neighbors work with your HOA to kind of revamp some of these areas um, if the purpose is there. So again, let's continue to save efforts on water. Uh, Water-wise landscaping is what we need to do. We need to focus on appropriate plants, how to water them appropriately. Um, and it's important that um, water is available. We want water to be here. We don't want to have to shower once a week you know, um, we want to be able to flush our toilets. These are all important things, but we can continue to have beautiful landscapes if they're appropriate for it. Plus, we also need to think about maintenance and how we're maintaining these things and re-educating ourselves on how to do that. Um, remember, again, it's not the plant. A lot of times it is us, um, and we tend to overwater and be a little bit more uh, generous than maybe we need to be. All right, our last myth in just the last few minutes here is poinsettias, you should wrap or cover them on your way home because poinsettias are the wimpiest plants on the face of the planet and they can't handle anything. Poinsettias, uh, Amy did a very wonderful blog on poinsettias and talked all about the history of them. So they are a native plant to Mexico. They're in the Euphorbia genus, um, which actually has a lot of our weeds too, spurge cousin of the poinsettias. Uh, they're all known for having that milky white sap on any part of the plant that you break off. It can be irritating, so don't get it in your eyes. And if you have latex allergies, it's not a great thing. Uh, but poinsettias came to the United States about 1830 from Joel Poinsett, 
You see where the common name comes from. And they became a staple in our society in 1923 because of Ecke. Uh, so Paul Ecke Ranch was a huge producer. They do a lot of bedding plants and things like that. They're out of California, but they're the ones who really started to heavily propagate poinsettias. And today they still grow 70% of our commercially grown poinsettias, which is really impressive. That's a huge share of the market. So um, you can thank the Ecke family for that. Just a couple points about the botanical features of poinsettias that you, know, you might share later with family and friends. Uh, the flowers themselves are those little yellow things in the center of the plant. Um, technically, botanically, they're the cyathea. Um, where you can decide if a poinsettia is fresh or on its way out is whether or not the cyathea have bloomed. So when they're in tight bud and you don't see any of the little like anthers and stamens sticking out, um, that's a good sign. That means it's a young poinsettia. If they're at the blooming point, it just means that the poinsettia is a little bit older, more mature, may not last as long. The colored parts that we love are called bracts. Uh, those are the modified leaves. Um, so the bracts are going to be on the top of the plant and then the leaves are going to be below and they will be green. And again, all parts of the plant have that milky white sap. Are they poisonous? No. They are not poisonous. Oh, please help debunk this myth when you see this happening and say, no, absolutely not. This was such a weird link to the poinsettia. So I love it. The myth may have arisen from an unsubstantiated report in 1919 of a small child who died after chewing on a poinsettia leaf. So no actual verification that the child died. It's unsubstantiated, which means it may or may not have happened. Um, so it is not point, it is not toxic, and let me tell you why. So at Ohio State back in 1971, so for five decades, we have still thought that poinsettias are toxic. It wasn't kind, but what Ohio State researchers did is they took poinsettias, they blended them up, and then they fed them to rats. Okay, that's what they did. Um, and then they kind of anal analyzed, are the rats sick? Are they eating? Do they have any sort of like stomach distress? those kind of things. Um, but what they found is that the rats were basically completely fine. They didn't eat a lot of the poinsettia because they don't taste good. Um, and so that's what you need to know is like these plants do not taste good. Um, so what they concluded is that a 50 pound child in order to eat what the equivalent of what the rats consumed, they would need to consume 500 leaves. I can't imagine that any poor child is gonna sit there and feast on 500 leaves of poinsettias. They're gonna get bored. It doesn't taste good. They're just going to move on. Uh, so they are not toxic um, to humans. Um, to our pets, so if you have a nosy cat or a dog, um, they might get a little bit of toxicity. They might drool a little bit. They might get some stomach distress. Um, so again, do keep them away from your, your pets. And if your child is a little nosy, you know, educate them that these are not for eating, um, but you don't need to worry that they're going to be poisoned by them. Um, but do keep them out of reach. That is a good thing. And probably the latex sap, that white stuff is going to be more damaging than a lot of other things. So going back to the myth, when you buy your poinsettia, they always recommend that you wrap them up in that clear plastic sleeve. And they tell you to hurry to your car and don't do any other errands because the poinsettia is so fragile and so sensitive to temperatures that you need to make sure that you get it home and place it um, in, a, in a space where it's going to live then for the season. Uh, there is zone 10 plant. They shouldn't be subjected below 50 degrees. And when we're buying them in Colorado, you know, we have really cold days. So that is the current recommendation. So are they really that wimpy? Because gosh. Poinsettias. I mean, they're they're pretty sturdy from what I have experienced. So, no, they're actually stronger than you might think. So, I decided to do this study several years ago, um, just to see what it would take to really kill a poinsettia, and is it necessary to wrap them and run quickly from the store to your car to get them home so that they don't suffer. So, we did a couple experiments, uh, and this was in our old greenhouses. So, the first experiment, we bought these poinsettias. Um, and we did five different treatments. So we 
had them sit in standing water. So we took the sleeve and the sleeves don't have holes in them, the outer, the pretty sleeve at the bottom of the pot. And we didn't poke holes. So we had them sit in standing water. Um, one, we just didn't water at all. Um, one was exposed to a cold treatment um, with or without the plastic sleeve that you would transport them in. Um, and then one was a draft. So we put it in front of the exhaust fan in the greenhouses to see what would happen. Um, so after a few weeks, we kind of went back, we were accessing things, we took pictures. Um, water too much or too little is bad for poinsettias. So that's number one. Like if you adopt a poinsettia this winter, make sure that it's not too wet and not too dry, but just right. Um, they hated both of those things, did not do well. The draft, surprisingly, just made the plants smaller. So it made them more compact, but they were totally fine. They had no adverse effects. Um, so if you want a more compact poinsettia, put them in from, front of a draft. Um, and then the ones that we left outside for 12 minutes. So I was trying to envision how long would it take to walk from the store, to get to your car, to put the poinsettia in the car, to start the car, and then drive away. So I estimated 12 minutes and it was 21 degrees that day. Unfazed. Both plants exposed with or without their sleeve to 12 minutes outside in 21 degree temperatures had no effects at all. No browning of the leaves. Um, they didn't die. And so it was, it was kind of impressive. So with that, I really wanted to find out how I could kill these poinsettias without water. Um, so the second experiment, I exposed them to both cold and wind. Um, I just put them outside. I just threw the plants outside. It was 30 mile an hour winds that day, it was 32 degrees. And so I wasn't standing outside while the poinsettia is there. I watched from the window, um, but I just left the poinsettias outside. All that we saw even after that was maybe minor tip burn that we couldn't actually link to the cold or to the wind because it could have been from fertilizer. It could have been from, you know, too cold of water. There were so many things. And so again, poinsettias are actually pretty tough. So are they wimpy? No, I would actually say they're pretty stalwart. Um, using the sleeve during transport, I think will be beneficial because the bracts are so fragile. So making sure that you do have that sleeve to kind of keep it um, more in place, that is a recommendation. But in terms of the sleeve providing any sort of buffer against the temperatures, that's not the point. Um, they're not doing anything uh, to help protect that plant. And you can walk at a normal pace from your store to your car. You don't need to run. You don't need to hustle. You can do your other errands um, without worry that you're going to affect the health of the poinsettia. And the biggest thing is to make sure that the, the moisture of the media is appropriate. So those were the myths. Other things I thought of that I didn't get to cover today that I will talk about in the future. All wood mulch is the same. Arborist chips. Um, organic pest management, watering at the base of trees, and then one thing that we are studying uh, this next summer is clover lawns and their water use. Uh, so we will know in a few months uh, whether or not clover lawns actually do use less water or not. Uh, so just one more reminder that we will be having a webinar uh, January 10th at noon. Uh, with Dr. Chad Miller. There is the QR code. We can also look for that on the CSC Port website that is uploaded. We'd love to have you join us in the new year uh, for the best of annuals and perennials. And with that, I will turn it back to Amy and say thanks. Thank you, Allison. Thanks, Amy. That was really great. Um, hopefully you learned a lot today. Hopefully Allison dispelled some of those myths that you might have had. Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And hopefully you all have happy holidays and we'll see you in 2024. Take care, everybody.